Hey everybody, Chef AJ here with Dr. Doug Lyle, the co-author of The Pleasure Trap. We are at Emory in Atlanta. We are both speakers at the Remedy Food Project Conference, one of the best plant-based conferences there is. And I pulled Dr. Lyle aside after his brilliant lecture, Getting Along Without Going Along, which you can see in its entirety on his wonderful website, esteemdynamics, with an S, dot org. And I asked for a few minutes at a time to talk about a few things that I get asked a lot. So thanks for being here, Dr. Lyle. My pleasure. You look great, by the way. <laughs> Adorable. I just love this guy. So, Dr. Lau, one question I get asked a lot, and I don't know if there is a physiological basis or a psychological basis in this, but I run the Ultimate Weight Loss Program. We've had the privilege of having you speak so many times, is uh, very often people that lose weight, unfortunately, gain it back. Maybe some of it, maybe all of it. And they seem to have a more difficult time losing it again. Is there a physiological basis when we regain weight that our body just says, hey, enough? Or is it maybe because it's so devastating to gain the weight back that they just, that it, it's hard anyway, but it seems to be sometimes harder the second time around? You know, I think, uh, I think there, there, are several, there are several things that are, are involved here. Um, I don't believe so. I don't believe there's a physiological reason at all. Okay. The, uh, I think the, the, um, very often when people do something that's really difficult, uh, they, and, and then they don't do it anymore, mm -hmm. they actually underestimate how difficult it was the first time. Mm. So their memory says, that wasn't so bad. So women, for example, that have had a couple of children, right. after they have the first one, like it's unbelievably painful and sure. an incredible ordeal. And uh, I actually had one couple that they they went through this, and then uh, and the wife's immediate reaction was, you know, there's just no way I'm ever having another job. <laughs> and uh, then a couple years later, they had another one. And after the second one, they said that they needed to go down and sign a contract and an affidavit that they would never do it. <laughs> third time. Right. This is a sort of uh, we we have short memories for how difficult something actually was mm -hmm. uh, you can your memory can get it get it as a snapshot in other words you know it wasn't easy but it doesn't appreciate the entire process that you went through because that process might, might have taken months or years and so you you forget how much energy you pour into a long-term goal and I think that's what you're seeing is you're seeing a essentially a distortion of memory uh, and because when you start up the slope the second time, you're pretty confident that you can do it because you've done it before. And then you start finding out just how steep that slope is and it's like, whoa, this seems harder than it was the first time. Really? Yeah, and the truth is, is that it, it isn't any harder. You just don't appreciate how hard you worked the first time. Wow, yeah. wow. Yes. How can we help these people that have lost weight to not gain it back? Because it seems that everybody can lose weight, yes. but not everybody can actually keep the weight off. Sure. Um, usually, I mean, there's, you have to remember that there's constant pressure on us to, to fumble the ball here. In other words, your, your uh, nature, the, your natural psychology was built to, to follow certain rules uh, of behavior, and the rules of behavior are in the modern environment a disaster that's what the pleasure trap is mm -hmm. it's the story of how your natural environment uh, is not shaped for this particular problem and so it, so it's unusual for people to solve it and so it's only uh, it's a rarefied group of people that get this information are motivated and then incredibly they execute it you know what I'm saying so this is not these are these these are not normal individuals under normal status quo situations for people, and so as a result, it's no surprise that the, the slightest bit of sort of turbulence in one's life, or the slight slightest misdirection of, of time, energy, and resources, and now they're in trouble again, and uh, and so that it's not uncommon for people to have to go up this slope a bunch of times, um, and so that that's what I would say is that that um, it's, the same, it's the same information that gets you the second time around. You know it. Uh, there, there are some issues, some other motivational issues that I think will stop people from essentially taking the first step. Uh, those are uh, once they know the right direction to go. And uh, those have to do with, with some very tricky, subtle um, motivational dilemmas 
uh, that I delineate in, in the Continuum of Evil and also in uh, when, when I, uh, another webinar at McDougal's that I've done called The Slow Fast Way. And by the way, yes. ladies and gentlemen, these you can see for free simply by going to Dr. Lyle's website at esteemdynamic.org and by going to Dr. McDougal's website, drmcdougal.com. Dr. Lyle is a guest speaker on his free weekly webinars which take place Thursday at 11 a.m. Pacific time and Dr. Lyle has done a bunch of terrific ones on panic disorder and anxiety and so what he's referring to is available on both of these websites. Right, yeah I don't have it on my website yet because I'm a little bit of a flake right. but it is on Dr. McDougall's website. The slow fast way is the story of uh, that we need to essentially keep our expectations modest and keep our, our self trudging ahead and, uh, and to, to not set the goals so high that we feel intimidated and then we just quit. Okay, so uh, this is you know this is how it is that we have to do this, and it's uh, there are a few individuals that they can that they can make uh, I don't know stories out of. Uh, you're one of them. In wow. other words, you're 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 an unusual story of someone who got the information finally, but it was a remember this bread was ninety percent baked by the time you got the last last bit of information. Ah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So you had already come, you were already extremely facile in the kitchen. We we didn't have to get any new information about nutrition. Like you you knew essentially everything. You needed one last piece and then that one last piece now we got the combo lock open. But that piece was important because yes. without it, the puzzle wasn't completed. That's correct. And that's gonna be true for a lot of people. So a lot of people will, uh, will do well for a while, but they don't have enough pieces of the puzzle put together yet. And so, uh, and that's why these different webinars that we do are, are trying to address sometimes the, the limiting factor in, in, in an individual's life that is actually could be the difference between success and failure. That's why you got to keep getting yourself educated. I agree. So where do you think they should go for the puzzle? To True North, to Dr. McDougall, read the book. The Pleasure Trap is a great place to start. Yeah, The Pleasure Trap is pretty cerebral. Okay, this right. is for if you're if you're sort of in the upper part of the, of the bell curve for intelligence, The Pleasure Trap is a deep and interesting read. But it it, w it was not really meant for the the, the general public. Mm -hmm. Okay, this is uh, there there are books that are that are that are uh, easier easier going. I would say the China Study is also a difficult book. Yes, that is not a that that's a book for for bright people who really want to make sure that they're right and you want to nail down all the details. This story has been told many different ways by many different people. John McDougall has told this story. 15 different times in slightly different ways. Always looking to try to make it easier, you know, or more convincing for different uh, uh, groups of people. And so uh, they tend to be a similar group. They tend to be bright. They tend to be health conscious. They tend to be conscientious, um, uh, et cetera. But, but everybody's a little bit different in terms of their, their and, and they're different where they are in that moment in their lives and how much, how much knowledge they already bring to the table. Right. You know, you talk a lot about the environment being so important. Yes. We are in an unnatural environment, and yes. that's why it's so hard to solve this problem. Yes. I was taking a seminar in Hollywood the other day, and I didn't want to fight traffic, so I called Lyft. Yes. And my driver was from Uganda, yes. and he had only been there for a few years, and for whatever reason, we started talking about nutrition. Yeah. And even though he wasn't vegan or vegetarian, you know, he was very nice looking and yes. slender, and he just did not understand processed food. He said, we don't have that in my country. And he goes, there is some, but you have to be very wealthy to have it. And here's a man who, I don't know if he was in his 30s, never eaten processed food, and now he's in this country, and he still doesn't eat processed food. Right. And he didn't understand processed food. So, right. you know, it sounds like the only way we can actually get out of the pleasure trap maybe is to either live at True North full time or live in Uganda, because the environment is Ball. It's a fascinating story. In other words, he his, his, he sort of is a conservative by nature in his behavior, or else he would have experimented. Ah. You know, so he is a very unusual man. The, uh, an unusual man that uh, most people like that would have never left Uganda. In other words, he's open enough to experience, but for some reason, 
there, there's some strange story in that in that guy's history. Oh, I can't the, find uh, it. Yeah, yeah so yeah. I don't know. Somebody open more open to experience dragged him to the United States. He well, to money. He needed to send money to his family. A very interesting a story to, yeah. because uh, because almost everybody uh, is feverishly interested in the food mm -hmm. and one taste of processed food, and of course, it's supernatural food. Yeah. And so, uh, but amazingly, he has sort of kept his his target and, and good for him. Yeah, we have to continually make healthy food plentiful and available in our own environments. Yeah, I actually forget to say that, AJ, and then you say it to me and then I hear it again. I'm like, right, that's so right. It's not nice to have your own words like fed back mm -hmm, to you. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. like, yeah, somebody's got it right. Yeah. And the issue is the environment. You, you need to work harder on your environment that, than you do on yourself. That's what you've told me yes. and, and I do believe that because when I see people, relapsing in the program yes one out of a thousand maybe drove to 7-eleven but the other 999 it was always something in the house yes. that was for a family member right. and I don't see how that's gonna work if right. there is like the alcoholic keeping alcohol in the house I don't see how that person's gonna get healthy when there's donuts and pizza and that stuff uh, I don't know that I would be able to hold up very well yeah in other words the uh, I'm just, I'm not like Alan. Alan's not, Alan Goldhammer's not open to experience. Right. It's, it's totally boring. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, yeah, and that, that is actually one of the reasons he is so unusual and remarkably successful mm -hmm. is uh, he happens to have a very interesting personality for this niche. Yeah. And uh, in the same way that there are people that are so hyper conscientious and so mathematically brilliant that they worry about the smallest detail, those are the guys that got us to the moon. You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So there's there's horses for courses. And most of us, our natural personalities are are open enough to experience that that we are easily led into trouble. And if you had me in a household, even today, uh, eventually I would probably get worn down if you had a bunch of pizza around and you had a bunch of ice cream and mm -hmm. Fritos. Uh, if you had enough junk food around uh, and the and I had to go out and hunt down and deal with and create my own whole natural food, you know, my own healthy yeah. food. I, I would wind up probably pretty significantly compromised. I wouldn't become a conventional eater, yeah. but I would probably move one third that direction, and that would be a problem. Yeah. You know what I mean? So uh, I, I agree with you. We have to work hard on our environment, and we have to like set up boundaries and agreements and rules if we yeah. share space with other people. Right. Uh, and there, there has to be, you know, ways for us to to work on that variable. And I think it's negotiable because so many people just say, well, okay, well, my husband and my kids want it, so this is how it shall be. And I think you can work on these things and sure. negotiate it. Can be respectful. It doesn't, you know. Yeah. And, and I always tell people, look, have them eat it outside the house. You know, we grew up kosher, Dr. Lyle, and um, my parents didn't always keep the the. They, they they let us eat non-kosher food, but only outside the house. And at first I thought, well, you're kind of hypocritical. But as I grew up, I realized that was brilliant. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That if we were going to do that, better outside the house so that our house could remain kosher for the rabbi to eat at. And, and I think it's the same thing with this junk food. If You, you don't have to say, I'm never going to have this again. Right. But to not have it in your house, I think, is reasonable. Yes. And particularly anything that is, that is uh very attractive to the individual that's trying to be healthy. Mm -hmm. People could put food in my house and I couldn't care less, and they sometimes have. Yeah. So uh, there, there's been eggs in my refrigerator, yeah. and I, I couldn't care less. <laughs> yeah, like, I do? mean, I'm not gonna do yeah. anything with an egg. Right. And so, the, uh, but it depends on what it is. So we don't want stuff in the house that will lure us into the trap. That's not a good yeah. idea. Yeah. yeah, just in case somebody watching has never heard of the pleasure trap, just briefly, what is the pleasure trap? Yeah, the pleasure trap is is um, what happens to us when we run into uh, an environmental stimulus that we were not designed for. So for example, we could be a teenager that gets introduced to cocaine. Mm. You were not designed for cocaine. Nope. So, uh, cocaine, what it does is it hyperactivates the pleasure centers of the brain. Your brain is designed with sensors that tell it when it's run across things that are unbelievably valuable for survival and reproduction, like attractive members of the opposite sex, for example, or same sex, depend upon your proclivity. But the point is attractive members of our species and really tasty food. Uh, and also very beautiful environments. Beautiful environments are 
beautiful landscapes are things that tell us that this is a good place for us to live. And so you, we, are, we are designed by nature with essentially beauty detection mechanisms. And that will also include smells. So for example, when it comes to mates, we are designed to actually like certain smells of mates because it indicates that their immune function uh, chemistry is a very good match for ours. So little did we ever know this, but chemistry literally is chemistry, right down to the level of the immune system. The, um, so we are attracted to certain things, and it's gonna turn out that you can make those things what we call super normal. So super normal with food, we've put the food together and taken it apart and essentially concocted foods that hyperstimulate the pleasure pathway. Drugs hyperstimulate the pleasure pathway. The um, actually, Modern music that's made in studios essentially does the same thing. Now that's a really benign version of, of what we're gonna call process stimulation. So it can be a beautiful sound and it can be a more beautiful sound than voices that you would have heard out in the village because we've got instrumentation on in an incredible studio. And uh, so that's a super normal stimulation. But there are, su so not all super normal stimuli are dangerous, but some of them are. Okay, and, and one of those supernormal stimuli is going to be the modern food supply. The modern food supply, uh, chips, chocolate, hot dogs, ice cream, you know, white flour, sugar, salt, and fat mm -hmm. uh, in, in high concentrations. And especially when they're together. And they're together. And animal food, for example, uh, animal food is typically, uh, animal food all by itself out of the natural world would have been reasonably benign for people. But cheese isn't. Right, but cheese is not a natural food. Right. And cheese is a hyper fat, hyper fat, uh, a salty product. Uh, it doesn't even remotely resemble anything that our ancestors got right. into. But we are, but we have taste preferences for the chemicals of s salt and fat. And we were designed by nature to be very excited when something was 5% fat instead of 4% fat. So a very tiny difference makes a big difference. Just as we can tell the difference between very small differences in sugar content between an apple that's ripe and one that's not quite ripe. So we're designed to be highly sensitive to very small differences in these chemicals and the modern food just takes that completely to, to the moon. In other words, instead of um, an apple being uh, uh, 280 calories a pound apple, in other words, an apple with, with maybe nine calories in a bite, um, mostly fiber and water and vitamins and minerals and a little bit of sugar. Uh, a very ripe apple might be 10 calories in a bite. So literally one calorie difference, uh, an apple that is 300 calorie a pound type apple, that one calorie a pound, one calorie uh, a bite difference is the difference between not wanting to eat that apple and wanting to eat that apple, nine calories against 10. But a, a, a same size bite of chocolate is 100 calories. So you can imagine that nine calories is literally unacceptable. 10 calories is very good. You can now imagine what happens when we go to 100 calories. That, that is essentially overblowing the circuits. And if you, if you eat things that are chocolate and you pay attention, you'll, if, you're, if you watch what happens and you, you in, in introspect on it, it literally is overblowing the circuits. You essentially can't even taste the impact of that within seconds after you've eaten it. it. It is so intense that the taste buds essentially lose their sensitivity very quickly, and it's only because the stimuli is so overwhelming that you can continue to taste it at all. Mm -hmm. And so, but once you have had this, the nervous system remembers that that is way richer than the apple. Mm -hmm. And so you are highly motivated to return to that because it knows that that's 10 times the calorie density and since you're designed for an environment of scarcity, uh, anything that is very intense and rich, uh, constant concentration, that's why we call it rich food. Mm -hmm. We don't call it poor food. <laughs> we call it rich food. Right. Okay. The uh, and so we are. You know that's what rich means. I.e., laden with the stimulation. Yeah. And so that's um, that's that's the problem of the pleasure trap is that that once exposed to this we have an addiction-like process that yeah. sets up, and, it's, and it takes a great deal of diligence to get out of anything like that. I like that word, diligence, because people tell me I have willpower. I don't think I do, but I am diligent, yes. because I see what happens when you go back to the chocolate, then the apple doesn't taste good, and right. I want my apple to taste good, so I stay away from the chocolate. Yes, you know? yeah, and it, it does require 
uh, diligence uh, in this. This is this is one of those things. You know, what I'm saying if you if you want to be a creative artist in Hollywood, you don't need this. You just need to be wildly creative with a big right brain and a lot of color splashing mm -hmm. through your personality. Mm -hmm. But if you want to do this walk, if yeah. you want to actually get fit and you want to get healthy, uh, it, it requires this diligence. Right. And if you don't have it, you have to cultivate it as best you can and uh, and protect your environment you know, like you were protecting your children. Right. I, I don't want to interrupt too much because you're so brilliant, Dr. Lyle, but people are commenting and sure. Heather says, I love him. He is just the most kind, knowledgeable man. And Heather, you forgot handsome, but okay. <laughs> it's just because people are saying are saying very kind things about you. You know, um I you know Gar Goldhammer, right? Sure. He's he's an unusual specimen yes. because he has not yet been exposed to the pleasure trap. Right. And I remember once at True North, you know, we were doing cooking demos. It was the extravaganza and so the cooking demo ended I think about three thirty. Dinner is served at five and we made food that he would be able to eat, yes. but it was not yet dinner time. And it was, I think, like something like a pumpkin muffin, not not too hyper palatable, but maybe a little bit more so. Right. And so I, he's, about, I guess, about 30. And so he said, Gar, would you like a muffin? You know, and he literally like looked at it and like for five minutes and it was like he was running some kind of calculation. Yes. And he said, yeah, I would. But I think if I eat that, then I'm not going to enjoy my dinner. Yes. I mean, they're, like most humans, it's just, it's, so what I mean, and I'm like, but I learned something from that, and yes. that's what I learned is that yeah, if I eat some of this rich food, maybe I won't gain weight, but then I'm not going to enjoy my food. Right. And so I would rather enjoy the food every day like I do than have to keep neuroadapting from this rich food to the the simple food. Sure. And that was a little kid, you know, a kid, little kid, a kid that, that kind of made me think about things that way. Yes. Like, yeah, sure, I could have this, but then I'm not going to enjoy my food. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he, and it comes to him. Pretty naturally, yeah. You know, what I mean, so he, he's, he's, he's one of those people that was born with that kind of natural vigilance, yeah. And and good for him. That's why his dad was able to pull this off. Right. Well, you know, you mentioned that that Dr. Alan Goldhammer has a unique personality for to be able to succeed in this. Yes. If if we don't have that personality, should we just say why even try? I'm screwed. <sighs> no, that that would be like someone who is, for example, getting B's in high school. Mm -hmm. And they're watching somebody else who breezes through and gets A's mm -hmm. and says, why bother? You know what I'm saying? So wait a second. The, if, if, we, if we don't work reasonably hard, we're going to get C's and D's. Uh -huh. If we work very hard, we may get some A's. See what I'm saying? So, so the notion is, is that, that, of course, uh, there are people that are going to be more naturally gifted in, in some areas in life. That's just, that's just the way this is. Mm -hmm. And so Alan... I, I don't know, with Alan's bland palate, he could never be the chef that you are. Right, but he liked the soup that you liked, interestingly enough, the creamy curried kabocha squash soup. Yes. You both liked it. Yes. And that had a little bit of spice to it. Right. It was salt free, but it had a little curry, and yes. I was surprised you both actually enjoyed that soup. Right, because we usually, I'm a little, I got a little more flair. <laughs> 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 you know, You're a little more open to experience. Yes. Yeah, so I'm going to like things a little jazzier than he's going right. to like them. But I was yes. surprised that he, you but know, he liked it at all. Liked it, yes. and, and I was very, very pleased that, right. that that he could still recognize good food even with his yes, <laughs> even palette. with that palate. Yeah. Yes. So that, that's interesting. Yeah. It's um, we have the holidays coming up, yes. and this is a period notorious for people relapsing, going off plan, gaining weight, right, and. A lot of them feel like, well, you know, I failed so many times, you know, why even try? Like I had a Snickers on Halloween, right. so I may as well just eat my way through to oblivion until January 2nd. But I believe you're going to be a guest on the upcoming holiday webinar and hopefully give us strategies. But can we give people hope that it's it's not hopeless, it's not futile, that they don't have to eat themselves into oblivion and, and they can do a pretty good job? Yes, uh, th this is going to be a lot more... It it's going to be much easier for people that actually control their own living environment once again. Yes. And so uh, for myself, when I've gone through situations where there was a party or some such thing and I had a bunch of food around uh, a after a holiday extravaganza, uh, what, uh, what I did was I threw it all out the next day. Nice. Now let me tell you, this is very interesting. If there's one thing that comes close to a skill uh, one of the skills that I developed. I, I actually can tell you how this happened. I had a friend of mine who lived in a high rise 
and they they you didn't take your trash downstairs to the dumpster. You had a laund it had like a laundry chute. Yeah, so big high rise. So you uh, you walk out into the uh, into the hallway, mm -hmm. and you dropped your garbage sack into a chute, and um, I I uh, somebody had given me like a box of seized candy, mm -hmm. and I had brought it over, and so we had a few pieces of it. And I was looking at that because there was a pound of it. Mm -hmm. And there was two of us. And I'm thinking, I, I know this woman isn't going to want very much more of this. Mm -hmm. And I am definitely not, I do not want to sit here and finish this box, which I will yeah. if, if I just let events unfold. Mm -hmm. And um, so what I did was I, I took out, out about three or four pieces and I set them on the counter, and I took that box, and I took it down out to the laundry chute. <laughs> and I mean, the, the, the tear trash chute. And what was interesting about it was that it only took a few seconds, and it's gone. Mm -hmm. The decision's over. Right. Okay? And so this, this uh, I had another incident about, th this is a little bit, this is, there's a concept under here. And the concept is you want to um, break down a problem into something that may actually only be a few seconds, and you can live through almost anything for a few seconds. Mm -hmm. So I only had to I only had to have enough discipline to say it's going to take me five seconds to walk out this door, get to that shoot, throw it in the shoot, and it's done. Mm -hmm. The decision is over. I'm not going to have to be sitting here making these decisions back and forth and negotiating with myself for the next hour and a half. Mm -hmm. It's not going to happen. Okay, so I'm just going to get it done. And the um, I had another situation uh, many years ago when I had a friend that was goading me to go on the Texas Giant, which is a big, high roller coaster in Dallas Fort Worth. Wow! And I didn't want to go, it and I was just stubborn scary. enough. Scary! It sounds I'm just scary. stubborn enough. Yeah. It's like, no, I don't need to do this for my life. Yeah. And uh, and I was really getting a lot of pressure, and I looked at this thing and I stared at this, and I actually stared at it for about 15 minutes as they kept people kept going down this mm -hmm. thing, and I noticed something. And what I noticed was the big drop was the only drop that was scary. Okay, the secondary drops were not that big a deal. Interesting. The big drop, I timed it, it was two seconds. Wow. So I said to myself, I can last anything if I know it's two seconds. Yeah. So I went on that thing and I told myself all the way up that thing, it's two seconds, it's two mm -hmm. seconds, wow. it's two seconds. And then you know, I, I remember like, yelling as I'm coming down but I knew it was only two seconds yeah and so it's there it's gone and then it's like okay the rest of the ride I'm fine wow. and so that is how I got through the Texas Giant and I was not that upset about it wow. whereas I didn't before it was like no way I'm not doing that that's too upsetting for me yeah. you know what I'm saying and so in the same way I've now learned that discipline or problems a lot of times take it's a few seconds it's not very much so a bunch of crap in your kitchen. One conceptual problem that people have is about money and food. Mm -hmm. This goes back to the Stone Age. You don't waste food in the Stone Age. Sure. It's a scarcity. But today you have to realize, no, we're wasting food like crazy. Yeah. And food is at an excess. And don't try to save five bucks mm -hmm. by saving all the junk food. This is a yeah. total waste. It's a, mis it's a misallocation of your life's resources. You will never be hungry. Nobody that is living in range of this video will ever you know be long-term hungry in their life they may be hungry because they're waiting at an airport without food yeah. but you will never you will not die from a shortage of food right that will never that is impossible that's interesting right so once you get that idea the idea is you can throw this food out throw well, it give it out. to somebody give it to a neighbor even yeah too much I'm, that's even too much trouble for me what i do is once i get ahead of steam I start taking action on these things and I'll clear out that kitchen and get rid of everything and it'll be gone in two minutes. It's over. So Andrew Spudfit Taylor, who you are going to meet at the next McDougal Advanced Study Weekend, yeah. he's the bloke from Australia eating nothing but potatoes for a year who's lost 120 pounds, Got writes, it. says hello to you and he says, the moderation myth is my favorite chapter from any book I've ever read. And that's oh from the my Pleasure goodness. Yeah. And he's, he's, doing, he's doing really great now. So yeah, you know, I noticed I've, I've dined with you a few times and you seem to be very similar to my husband, Charles, and it drives me crazy, but both of you guys leave food on your plate. Yes. And I dined also with Alan. <laughs> we don't leave any food right. on our plate, us Jews. I don't know what it is. Maybe it's from, right. <laughs> from being in Nazi Germany, but me and Alan don't leave food on our plates and right. you and Charles do. And I always look at you like, how do you leave? 
And then maybe you'll even have dessert, but it's like, but how can you have dessert? You left something on your plate. You right. can't leave something on your plate. You don't do that. My dad said you don't do that. Right, right. Yeah, I actually, somewhere along the line, I got it in my head. Uh, this was probably from reading the research that's done that shows that animals that are systematically underfed live longer than mm. other animals. And so this comes from way back from, you know, 25 years ago for me. And I, once that idea was in my head, and it was well established in scientific literature, that I started to have this little open loop in my head that said, eh, just, just eat 95% of what it is that you want. That's like a Japanese thing called harabachi bu, where they uh, eat a little bit less. A little bit less. And so I'm not going to say I do it all the time, because mm -hmm. I'm not always thinking about it, but I generally do think about it. Wow. In other words, as I, as I come to the end of what's on my plate, my attitude is, can I easily live without it? And the, the answer is almost always yes. And so I just leave a little bit on my Gosh, plate. I just, I can't, I try, but that last <laughs> bite, it's like, what do we do, throw it out? Yeah, I just throw oy, it out. Oy, oy, oy vey, oy vey. <laughs> I don't know if I can do that. There you I'm go. I'm going to try, and I'm going to try to do it in your honor. Yeah. So we don't want to get political, but we sure. have an election here that upset a lot of people. Sure. And what was interesting is a lot of people relapsed the day after the election. They were upset. Yes. And and I understand that it's upsetting, but a lot of things in life are upsetting. People sure. have things happen to them, trauma, drama, abuse. We all do. We all have stress. And you once said that people don't eat for emotional reasons. They mm -hmm. take drugs for emotional mm -hmm. reasons. And the, but the foods that people are eating are these drug-like foods. Sure. So you being a psychologist, I'm sure you help people with things other than weight loss. How do we get people to not have eating these hyperpalatable foods as the default? We are going to lose loved ones. We're all going to have things happen that we would rather not. That's life. Sure. So how do we retrain people to not just go from the sorrow to the cookie jar, but maybe what, what can they do instead? Well, the truth is, is that these, these, uh, these events are always more complicated than anybody says. Mm -hmm. So in the same way that your success, AJ, was you were literally on the five yard line and then you needed a little bit more information and, and then you were in the end zone. That's what happened to you, mm -hmm. okay? The, um, in the same way that when people are wobbling, okay, and they say, oh, well, the election happened and I'm all upset and then I had to go to Dairy Queen. Right, that's exactly yeah. what they said. Yeah, they were wobbling before that happened. <laughs> oh, because so I was upset too, but sure. it didn't make me eat. If anything, it made me not eat because I was sick to my stomach. Sure. But... All, all good. The yeah, point is, is that it's not so simple. It's... And, and it's also, it, it's a little, uh, something that I've said that is, um, that, that I want to, I want to clarify so people understand kind of where I'm coming from. My sort of eyeball estimate of this notion of emotionality and eating mm -hmm. is that, that people will uh, eat for some, um, they will do some celebrating. Mm -hmm. They'll do a little bit of medicating with the with uh, i.e. They'll, they'll try to move the the needle on their present emotional state uh, with food, but it, it's always rich food. People don't um, people don't eat for emotional reasons. They eat junk food for emotional exactly because they don't just go say God, I have to have more broccoli slaw right now. Never, never. Okay, and also what I'm trying to also help people explain is that the reason they eat junk food isn't for deep problems emanating from their childhood. Mm -hmm. That is, that's what I'm attacking in the pleasure trap. That's what I'm trying to explain. What I'm trying to explain is, is that the, the tendency for people to, to eat junk food is a, is a uh, trans species characteristic. This isn't just humans. Mm -hmm. Any animal will eat the pleasure trap. Yes. Any animal will eat the pleasure trap. The pleasure trap is you can addict any animal to anything that would naturally oh, yeah. stoke its dopamine pathway. Yeah. And so we don't need to be hypothesizing deep reasons why somebody's having a problem at 35 and staying on a healthy diet. We already know why they're having trouble staying on a healthy diet. It's because they were designed by nature to eat the richest food in their environment. Mm -hmm. So we don't have, uh, so the one of the things that I think is I think psychologists and individuals and the people themselves are puzzled because they don't understand they want to do a good job, why are they not doing a good job? And so the disconnect between what is it they want to do and what is it they're doing leads them to think that there's some mysterious boogeyman that is actually causing this to happen. 
That is not the case. There's nothing wrong with the individual. The individual is actually uh, simply playing out the natural programs uh, of motivation that are in us, but in an environment now that has a bunch of drug-like food. And so do, do we go towards drug-like food when we get emotionally perturbed? Mm -hmm. Sure we do. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that makes perfect sense. But we're never going to get rid of those emotional perturbations because those are part of life. Right. And so what yes. can people do instead? I mean, what do you – because I'm sure that you have things in your life that are not yeah, well, always the way you want, but you don't go and eat that food. What I will tell them to do. Well, this, this is uh, – there's, of course, as I said, when you hear this story, they say, as you put it, why did they go to the cookie jar? Well, why is there a cookie jar? And why does it have cookies in it? Yeah. <laughs> and why are you within reach of it? Right. Okay, we, we come back to the problem the of the environment. Yeah. And so the the uh, so there this is going to be an ongoing challenge, but the better you manage your environmental circumstances, the less and less this is going to be a problem. And I think that's why the holidays are so difficult, because people are leaving their safe environment, yes. going to so many parties where they're not in control of their food, which and, is why I don't go. Right, I just and don't they're go. polluting their own environment. Sure. So they're, 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 they're making yeah. it a problem. And you should know that if you do this, if you, if you walk into teasing yourself, mm -hmm. which many of us are going to do, then it's useful for you to know something about, about essentially your, your nature with this. And that is that because whenever you whenever you have a super normal situation, you eat a Snickers bar, you mm -hmm. have an ice cream cone, you have a bag of Fritos, then what's going to happen is those are very exciting events biologically. They're very intense. Mm -hmm. And as a result, they're, they're remembered very well. Mm -hmm. And so those memories are going to be very um, salient for the next few days. Now, they will fade. Just like it, just like what you talked about with your friend at, at dinner two weeks ago, you can't hardly remember what you talked mm -hmm. about. It's faded. Mm -hmm. You might have remembered very well the next day had we started to cue you, but two weeks later, you might not even be able to pull it out of there. It's essentially gone. In the same way that that your your uh, the the potency of the imagery that is that is recalled in you know in memory about an eating experience will fade fairly quickly, but not that quickly. So in other words, you can imagine a Stone Age situation where there's a rich, it's a, a tree of ripe peaches, and you ate five of them yesterday, and you remember the next day what it tasted like, and you remember that they're still there. Mm -hmm. So I'm saying, so it would make sense that we our memories would still be pretty salient. Two weeks from now, the peaches are ripe and they're gone, and if we were eating them two weeks ago, they're probably not there two weeks later. So therefore, the memory is not pounding us with it and telling us to get back over there. And that's exactly what will happen. We've got your, your toughest time after you have indulged yourself is probably about 72 hours. Wow. You have to understand that if you walk down that path for a little ways, you, your job is to stop yourself right there, to grit your teeth for a little bit, mm -hmm. and get through the three days that it's going to take where those memories are not pulling you so very So about hard. 72 hours yes. of thinking. You know, it, it, I just want to mention a comment. I think you'll get a kick out of it because you said human beings weren't designed for this environment. Shirley says she was not designed for this kind of election. <laughs> <laughs> and Colleen is calling it election depression. But, you know, when it, people, like, they don't get engaged or get a promotion and they go eat. Yes. It's always seems some, like a negative event. A family member died. So what do they do? They just call you for an appointment, which, by the way, Dr. Doug Lyle does do consults such reasonable a price he has and you can do even a half hour you can book it on his website which is www.esteemdynamics with an s.org he will do private consultations on phone or skype i'm telling you he'll blow you away so how do you help these people because they are going to have people loved ones die they're going to have so there's got I'm, what i'm trying to say is what what do we do i mean when these stresses occur and they're going to occur sure so what do you do? Call call you? Uh, go for a walk? Uh, you know. I, I'm not worried about it. What I'm worried about, I'm not so worried about that somebody may g go off to the store and get some licorice because that's yeah. what they always did. Yeah. Okay? So, but what we now have to understand is that if you have wobbled off course and you're having a hard time getting back on, right. you need to know that you've got about a, a, a three day, you know, about three days worth of trudging. And that's all you have to do. Yeah. yeah and, and the first day is by far the hardest. Mm -hmm. And the second day is quite a bit easier. And the third day is not too bad at all. Mm. By day four, you're back in the groove. You can be back on. And there's, a, there's, there's other things that are happening beyond 
the memory decay from, from rich food. Also, your self-esteem takes a hit, a hit when you go off course. Sure. And it t your self-esteem does not spring back immediately. So if, if I have a person that's struggling with alcohol and they relapse on, on Friday, mm -hmm. they, if, they, if, if they turn it around on Monday, they do not feel so good about themselves on Monday. They're still feeling kind of bad about themselves okay. that they went on a bender. Sure. So they don't, their self-esteem doesn't spring back. They're, but if they gut it out Monday and they gut it out Tuesday and they gut it out Wednesday, by Thursday morning, they're starting to feel like, okay, I'm not disgusted with myself. I'm doing a pretty good job. And so in that same way, you know, we need to tap into the resilience that, that, that comes. So, so this the problem is, is that we have two problems when, when we know what we should be doing and, you know, and, it, and it's a difficult thing to do and then we, we go off course and we are indulgent, two things happen. Number one, we get the supernormal stimuli and the memories that will try to chain this into a, a recurrent behavior forever. And so that, that's what will happen. The second problem is our self-esteem takes a hit. So it's literally two different motivational problems are triangulating and, and, and making it difficult for us to turn this around. So we need to know that we're you know three days away from not only starting to tame the pleasure trap, but also starting to regain a lot, you know, a significant amount of our lost self-respect. And so that's what we need to do. And if we do that, you can you can turn this thing around. That makes sense. I didn't realize that, that it also their self-esteem has taken a hit, and yes. that's why it's so hard. Not just from the physiological part of having all that crap in their system that's making them crave it, but then they're also feeling bad about themselves. It's huge. It's at least even. Wow. That is a huge part of the motivational dilemma here, is that a person may have gone for six months really clean, and then when they go off, there's a part of them that is disgusted with themselves. Mm. And, and so that since they planned to be so good, when they weren't so good, the idea of starting again today, it's like, well, what's one day in a row? That's nothing. Right. I had 180 days in a row where I did great. So what does it mean for me to go one day in a row? That's not impressive. They beat themselves up. When they, they beat themselves up yeah. over this. And instead, what they, what they don't know is how close to the surface a recovered self-esteem is. So literally, because they're still disgusted with themselves and they're in the throes of the pleasure trap with the hot memories, this can now chain a set of self-destructive behavior that could last the rest of their lives. Mm. Okay? And so this is bad news, and you and I have seen it. We've seen people go off course and then just stay off course I know, forever. I, or, or, yeah, or take or years to get take back. Take years to get back. And it's, when they didn't know that their self-respect was only about three days away. They didn't know how close to the surface the gold wow, was This buried. is going to help people hearing this because we Good. got one gal that was gone for three years. And yes. she had known it was only three, three days, days. Three days. Three days. By the time you get to the end of three days and you've done a good job, there's a little internal voice starts saying, not too bad, Sally. Not too bad, you know what I mean? You feel like you're back in the club yeah. and you have deserved re-entry. Right. And that's it, that it's important to know that so that we can turn people around quickly. So guys, look, it's not about relapsing, it's about just getting back on. Now you know, you've heard from the expert, you might have a couple of difficult days, but it's just three days, it's just. So one of the reasons I don't relapse, and you might've heard this story, is the one time I did the first face I saw was Goldhammer. And I'm just afraid now that if I do, he's just gonna appear and manifest. Oh my God, you that's know? priceless. So, oh. Yeah. Oh boy. So, you know, in the pleasure trap, one of the things that I found interesting was a concept I had never heard before, which was about the mechanisms of satiation. Yes. I don't know where you learned that, but the calorie receptors, the nutrient receptors, and the stretch receptors. Yeah. And this whole concept of stretch receptors was new to me, and I still find it interesting. Yeah. And I wonder, because we, we were all eating lunch together, there was about eight of us, various shapes and sizes, mm -hmm. and we were eating different volumes of food. Yes. And we were talking about the feeling of, of, of wanting to feel full. And right. three of us, and these were actually all people, we were all slender now, people yes. that were not slender before, eating the largest volumes of food. And we said, well, we're volume eaters. Yes. Do you think people vary in their, either maybe the sensitivity of their stretch receptors? Because Charles eats less food than me yes. by volume. And you, you give him one extra cashew, and he's like, yeah. oh, I'm so full. Yes. Whereas me, I seem to need a lot of food to feel full, right. which is why I love calorie density. 
do you think it's a genetic thing or do you think it's because I was overweight or maybe had an eating disorder? Is this just something that varies in the genetic realm? Mostly this is going to be genetic. Okay. So there, there's going to be differences in sensitivity to different signals. So whether it's stretch signals or specific nutrient signals like fat. Mm -hmm. So Charles, I've met Charles, he's built like me. You so, guys are two peas sure. in a pod. So yep. Charles and I are a couple of guys that if you feed us a little chunk of fat, our system says, whoa, you just gave us a lot of calories. Right, he, he could sense it. When I would try yes. to hide nuts in his smoothie, yeah. he would drink half of it and he goes, I don't know what you did, but I'm full. <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. That's exactly the experience I have. That's so and interesting. So, and yet there's people where it'll pass, it'll pass them right by. They'll eat the same pound and a half of food, whether it has 1,800 calories in it or 900 calories in it. And this is, you know, this is the problem with rich foods. The problem with rich foods are not going to, it's not going to hurt the freaks like Charles and I that can right. sense a calorie from a mile away. It's going to be most people, most people are not that, don't have that much sensation. Which is why oil is so insidious, Disaster. which is why a restaurant meal that you made at home yes. in a restaurant would be 500 calories more, but yes. it's from oil and you can't sense it. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, Charles and I are the equivalent of people with really, really good vision. Wow. In other words, we can just see. We've got like 2,200 vision. Right. Like we can see way further than everybody else. And we can see the calories coming. Yeah. And the most people cannot see the calories coming. That is and God forbid you're, you're nearsighted. Yeah. You know what I mean? Well, you're going to end up fat. If you are a curvy girl or a big strong guy, you almost certainly cannot see those calories coming, which just means you better know where they are because you can't see them. That is so Interesting. Yes. Do you think that people vary uh, genetically in the ability of how much fat they can eat and be fat? Because I know there's doctors, some of them plant-based, but some of them not, telling us to eat a lot of fat, whether it's oil or not. And then some like Dr. Esselstyn and Dr. McDougall who are telling us to eat low fat, and which is where, where I stand and Dr. Goldhammer. But I guess what I'm trying to say is, are there, do we, is this a genetic variation as well? Because some people can eat a lot more fat sure. and be slender sure. and it's sort of like Jack Spratt could eat no fat his wife this is a genetic thing of right of course so it's, a, it's absurd to be telling people to eat a higher fat diet because the truth is is that all of us are going to do really well down at you know 15 percent fat mm -hmm. and and some of us will do just fine at 30 percent fat mm -hmm. so Charles and I would be fine yes we could we could uh and provided we didn't have uh cardiovascular proclivities we we could we could eat oil on our food, sure. and we would we would eat it in a modest amount, but we could eat probably a thirty percent fat diet and still look about the way we do. Yeah. The um, but we wouldn't be quite as healthy, but it would look about the same. Yes. Whereas somebody else eats thirty percent fat and they're going to be forty pounds overweight, they can't get away with it. Yeah. So to be telling people, I could just see some moderate to thin doctor who with his, with his family, you know what I'm saying, that mm -hmm. is also moderately thin genetically, saying that's not a problem. It's like, oh yes, it is a problem. You gotta look at the whole species. Yes. And when you look at the species, as you start to add any kind of processed food, it doesn't have to be fat, it can also be processed carbohydrate. The, uh, but, when, but fat in particular is so rich that when you start to add, you know, it, particularly any kind of processed method of getting fat, specifically oils, mm -hmm. uh, it, when you do that, people start to get fat. Even thin people get a little fat, but you can't tell. Right. You can't tell the difference. If you put one pound of fat on Charles, nobody in the world no. would see it. Well, well, you know what's interesting is he he's six feet tall, yes. and when I married him, he weighed 160. He was still thin. Yes. When we stopped oil, I didn't tell him, so right. he didn't even know. That's right. how we know it was It was a true experiment. Yes. Let's see, he lost, um, he, he, he lost, 18 pounds yes, there you go. In, in like seven months without even knowing. And that just shows that... that totally unconscious mechanisms. Yeah. Which is, uh, it's so beautiful when somebody like yourself runs experiments. When I people... do it on him all the time. And then when I took the nuts out, he, I mean, now he weighs 134. Pretty yes. soon the guy's going to waste away because yes. <laughs> just because of my experiments. So, but yeah. you know, I did, I, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I did the same thing to my dog, Bailey. Yes. And I mean, and not that I didn't do it sure. on purpose, but she had gained weight and then she had a liver problem. She needed to lose weight. Yes. And it was, again, like you say, the pleasure trap. Right. It was taking the pleasure trap food, which was the dry dog food. Right. And I moved that away and I substituted half her food with cooked carrots. Yes. 
low calorie density and I was able to get weight off of her but still giving her a feeling of fullness this stuff never doesn't work it doesn't right. matter the species because Bailey couldn't say it was psychological right her weight gain was not psychological right. and her weight loss was not, not because of diligence sure it was because of the pleasure trap of course you got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I it. love this stuff. I yeah. love this stuff. Well, I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I'm going to go to one question um, that got asked. Yes. You, you don't cheat, treat children, right? Because a woman is saying that she used your techniques for panic and told her daughter to run in place, but her daughter was still freezing or something. Still on freezing. So can the, is that too young of a child to contact you or the, the no, mother could contact but here's you? here's what I would say. Mm -hmm. What we want to do, that child, uh, what we want to do is we want to... The next move in that problem is to get more alert as to when the panic attack starts. So the notion is here is that we we start to get we start to really be on the lookout for adrenaline rises, and we even want to start to do this even when it's very mild or even when it's not happening at all. So, for example, just every now and then we're, we're going to drill it. And you're going to get up and you're going to run in place for a little bit and then rest and then run in place for a little bit and then rest and run in place for a little bit. So we might do that. It might be a three-minute exercise to do that. The, um, even, even running in place for a little bit, who's someone who has panic disorder, will actually cause a little bit of mm -hmm. anxiety-like symptoms because we're going to be breathing hard and sweating a little bit, et cetera. So what we want to do, though, is we want to get the person so that even when they're having a little bit of adrenaline rise, they go for this. And they do this. And so they watch the fact that they can process out my mild amount of anxiety. This then gets them more ready. We don't sit and wait till we're having a full blown blow, blow panic attack. We jump on this thing very early. And then in doing so, we, we are getting the person sensitized to those adrenaline rises and we are teaching them unconsciously that they actually have it under command. And that's how that's where I would go with that child. Right. They could they could certainly talk to me if they want to, but that's what I would say. And tell them. and um just so you guys know, when I met Dr. Lyle in January of two thousand eleven, I actually didn't end up I didn't try to start seeing him and Dr. Goldhammer for weight loss. I was there for a completely different reason. I went to True North because I had panic disorder and agoraphobia. I had lived in my house for a year and lost my house because of the inability to work. And within one session, he after having this condition for years, he pretty much cured my panic disorder and now the only time I have panic attacks are under extraordinary circumstances like missing an airplane or having a pit bull come at me or having a major car accident. So if you have this condition, it is completely treatable. And Dr. Lyle also got me off my psychiatric medicine. So consider signing up for a consult. You'll be glad you did at www.esteemdynamics.org and watch all his wonderful videos. And if you want more of Dr. Lyle, please consider signing up for the holiday webinar. He's gonna be a speaker. He's gonna be the home run speaker the last day, which is December 21st. You can get that information on eatunprocessed.com. Dr. Lyle, you are like the funnest, most brilliant, best looking plant-based doctor. Doesn't he look like Alan Alden when he smiles? You're so beloved. When he spoke at the in-person one, all the women, even the married ones were saying, I love him. I love him. I love him. So, <laughs> so thank you. Is there any, and he's turning red right now, yeah. guys, you can't see that. So guys, thank you for watching. We will archive this. We'll get this on YouTube. Anything else you want to say to these people? You have over a hundred people watching and we didn't even announce this. This is the thing. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thanks for having me, AJ. I yeah. just love working with you. It's great fun. Yeah. yeah. Well, you guys consider coming to the live ultimate weight loss seminar on Labor Day weekend, 2017. Meet Dr. Lyle in person, Dr. Goldhammer in person. And thank you guys so much. Say goodbye, Dr. Lyle. Bye, folks. It's really creepy. Oh. There we go. Oh, shoot. Where did it go? This was so great. Oh, well.